Hello again. Now I'll talk to you about the fuzzy genetic optimization model that we use. Um, the capabilities of the model is an evolutionary multi-objective optimization model for SOS architecting with numerous key performance parameters, attributes. Um, it involves a dynamic assessment of the domain inputs. You need the domain model and the assessment model. And then by using the genetic algorithm, um, you can run through a whole number of, of uh, architectures represented in this case by chromosomes, ones and zeros, saying which systems and which interfaces are present. Uh, this allows us to uh, rapidly go through a whole number of uh, architectures, find a very good one, and uh, present that for follow through with the rest of the Phylosos model with uh, basically finding the, the uh, systems that will cooperate to uh, make your system of systems. It allows us to change attributes or uh, rules about the attributes uh, change the values that we prefer out of the attributes and just play around with that whole set of variables in a way that gives you an answer within a minute or two to say yes given this condition this set of uh, uh, architectures or this architecture out of a set um, is a good one and um, the part of what we do is uh, look at the output and, and see patterns in it and things like that that can help us uh, try to figure out what would be good rules to use to uh, move on to better architectures or improving the architecture over time. Um, what this does is, is um, allow us to, to look in the framework, the meta-architecture, and, uh, and pull many architectures out of it. So um, this takes into account net centricity, things that you get by interfacing systems. And uh, you can actually do uh, competing objectives and, and find things that are pulling you in uh, nearly orthogonal directions and try to find a, a best uh, compromise between them. Uh, in a very rapid way. We can do this over and over again as you change the architecture, change the input domain, adjust systems, change their capabilities and so on. You can do that each wave and therefore uh, run through uh, the, the multiple waves. You can apply this to any domain. Uh, we've tried it on several domains so far, uh, mostly network centric systems so far, but uh, it's equally applicable to uh, supply chains, uh, logistics things, uh, your, your uh, attributes could have to do with uh, time in transit or uh, efficient use of gas or things like that. There's all kinds of ways that, that you can change the domain in, in the setup that we have so far. That's all in the architecture assessment part of it. And now we're going to talk about given you have a way of deciding what's a good architecture, now let's go through a whole bunch of them and uh, see if we can find one that makes everybody happy. Um, why are we there? Um, future capabilities, we, we can uh, have multiple interfaces between the systems. Right now, we use only a single uh, first order interface. So A interfaces to B, and we're not doing a to B to C to D, and then what happens? Um, we do do a little bit of that for one part of it, uh, but it's, it's very limited. Uh, but you could put in uh, multiple connections or something like that. It would be a more complicated graph uh, to solve. Um, we, we can estimate the complexity of, of the system and things like that. There's th measurements that you can make on the, the arrangement of uh, systems that can help you decide whether that's a good way to go in your evolution of the system. Um, so what we're assuming is that you have a structure for the potential architectures. We're talking about the systems 
and their first order interfaces. That's our structure. Uh, and that's represented in a chromosome of bits, ones and zeros, whether the system is there and the interface to another system is there. And for the genetic algorithm portion of it, we randomly fill that structure with ones and zeros. And we make a population of that numerous times up to P. Typically we use about uh, 50 or 100 uh, in the population. You can use many more. If you use uh, 1,000, it takes much longer and uh, you don't need to do very many generations. Uh, if you use, uh, there's trade-offs that you can make between large populations and number of times you run it, generations, and you can watch how things converge and, and uh, try to decide what's the best way for your individual problem, the way it's set up. But basically, you create a population of strings of ones and zeros. The population has, on the order of 100 uh, elements, and each of those represents an architecture, a trial way of putting your systems and their interfaces together to see how it will work out. And the assessment portion of the um, file SOS does that, given an input, how does it work out? What we're doing now is deciding, okay, what input should we use? So one of the tricks we use to try to converge a little more quickly is in the initial population, we do not make it a completely uh, evenly distributed random population. In other words, because we're talking about fairly large number of bits, the law of large numbers would mean that on average, uh, most of your chromosomes would be 50-50, present or absent in your ones and zeros. Um, it would diverge around with that a little bit, but it would not be very large numbers or very small numbers. So we intentionally bias the initial population to have a range of very few numbers of bits to very large number of bits. They're still randomly selected, but the, the selection point is not 50-50 or not uh, you know, above or below 5 on your random number generator uh, on a scale of 1 to 10. It's above or below 1 at the beginning of the population and nine at the end of the population. So um, that just makes sure that we have kind of a sprinkling of, of uh, uh, different numbers of, of systems in the architecture. <clears throat> so um, what this looks like is the systems uh, present over here on the left uh, and whether they're connected to, to uh, something. So these lines show connections, for example, between system two and system seven, and system two and eight, and then you skip nine and 10, and two is connected to 11, and so on, throughout the whole thing. Um, that's a way of representing which systems are present and which uh, interfaces do they have. And that's encoded in this list of ones and zeros. Um, and you can go back and forth. So there's a rule for how does the string convert to the, the system, the picture of the system of systems. And um, at this point, we're using very basic, simple, the system's either there or not, which is sort of typical of system of systems because you arrange a bunch of systems to work together to do a task and then one system goes down for maintenance or it, it has to go work on a different task and it's not there in time for yours or something like that because these systems have their own lives. They are not dedicated to you. You can use them uh, when it's necessary when you ask them to join together and become their system of systems uh, for this task that you have to do but they have their individual missions and, and uh, uh, stakeholders and purposes and work that they do on a daily basis. So it could be that that, that interferes or the priorities change or something. And uh, that's what happens. The system could be there or not. So it's a one or a zero. Um, what we do with the architecture then is we look at, say there's a whole bunch of systems and their interfaces on the top. We look at what is the quality of that system of systems based on the assessment model we we talked about in the other video. So we're using a scale of one to four 
one representing very poor, four representing very good, two and a half representing kind of the absolute average performance or in this attribute, whatever it is, of per overall performance of the task or affordability or any of a number of other uh, things that you could have uh, as attributes depending on your domain. So another uh, system down here might be very similar in performance even though it looks very different in which systems are used and which interconnects occur. So um, that's one of the interesting things about doing this because you might think well the right way to do it is just have lots of systems but if affordability is one of your uh, characteristics that you that you want to evaluate against and trust me everybody always does so um, a system with many less systems may be more affordable although we have allowed uh, individual systems to have their individual costs so if these turns out to be the most expensive systems maybe this is not the best one but anyway this one looks pretty good and then here's another one that's connected differently than either of the other two it's very bad and each one has its list of systems and interfaces that's what we're looking at and the quality ranges from very high to pretty low what you do is you take a number of these uh, rank them score them and and order them in the order of their rank and then you throw away the bad ones you throw away the bad ones and uh, uh, then you take the good ones that are left and you perform genetic algorithm operations. So uh, crossover is one of those. You can just uh, take two parents and cross them over. You pick a random spot any place along there and just switch the beginning of one and the tail of the other. And that's a new member of your population for the next generation. And your probability of applying a crossover is, does not have to be one. You don't have to do it every time. You only have to cross over a few. Um, another way to do it is to mutate bits in the system. So the crossover process allows you to look at very different looking architectures when you combine two wildly different chromosomes. And the mutation uh, process allows you to look at just tiny changes. So maybe one interface or one system flips from present to absent or absent to present um, and that's how you look at that so again um, you can do this at various rates you do it on each bit maybe between a tenth or a, a thousandth of uh, the opportunity to mutate and uh, that gives you either many mutations or relatively few mutations so uh, you might need more generations to get to a better answer with a low mutation rate. It depends on a lot of things. You have to sort of play with these and depending on your problem uh, and the way your systems and capabilities are distributed, um, we've, we've played with numerous of these uh, rates. So that's what you do. You, you, keep, you throw away the worst ones, you keep a few of the good ones and you mutate them and cross them over and uh, crossovers really make you look at very different looking chromosomes uh, and mutations make you look at minor changes around the current one you have or the current list of best ones so um, you sort them uh, you, t you retain the the better ones you perform your crossovers and mutations and create a new population of uh, the same size and then you repeat for the next generation. You find the fitness, you sort them, you throw away the bad ones, and so on. So uh, what you typically do is stop when this uh, uh, improvement uh, slows, when, when you find the best chromosome of each of those populations in a generation, you hang on to that one, and you watch how that one does compared to the newcomers in each generation. and. Uh, when you stop finding better ones, then you say, well, maybe I've uh, exhausted my ability to improve. Or you could just use a fixed number of generations. Typically, we use a fixed number of generations and um, look at how it converges to decide how much we want to mutate things. So again, 
you just look at the population and you keep the best ones and you throw away the worst ones and maybe a few of the lower quality, slightly lower quality, you keep because a minor change to one of those might just be beat the best one next time. And you do do those uh, wild changes with the crossovers, for example, to uh, look at, well, what if, I, what if I'm honing in on a, on a, a small part of a, a local uh, maximum in the uh, optimization of the surface uh, in all these dimensions of, of attributes. And, uh, you know, that, that makes sure you're not stuck on a local maximum and there's a be much better one only a little ways away. <clears throat> so this is the list of publications we've, we've created out of this uh, uh, work for uh, uh, the CERT RT109, uh, 15 uh, published things, uh, three journal articles. Um, these are the, the project team, uh, Dr. Dagley's principal investigator. All these other uh, professors have uh, done uh, portions of the um, uh, phylosos, the negotiations, several ways of assuming how the systems negotiate with each other and with the, the system of systems manager. Um, we've also done uh, uh, agent-based modeling of those uh, system of systems and uh, OPM or uh, colored petri nets uh, models of how the system looks when we, when we choose an architecture and its rules for how it interacts. We make a model that actually watches that over a period of time and sees how it, do, how it uh, performs. So um, there we are. The uh, DARPA has uh, supported this through the Systems Engineering Research Center, uh, affiliated with uh, or run by Stevens Institute of Technology.